in 2021 in Presque Hill County, Sheboygan County, any surrounding county, wherever you work, wherever you go, what we need is conviction in your message. And Jesus still saves in 2021. So notice in the book of Titus, chapter number 2, verse number 3, it's talking specifically to ladies and how you can make your home beautiful, that the aged women, likewise, that they be in behaviors becoming holiness. And that's not a dirty word, it's a Bible word. Uh, the Lord said, be ye holy, for he is holy. And then the apostle Paul reminded us of the same thing. Not false accusers, not given to much wine. Teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober. That word sober there is not talking about being drunk or not drunk, but rather it's talking about a serious mindedness, which we will get to. To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. And uh, we have, have a lady uh, that just doesn't attend church here anymore because when she started coming to church here, it just seemed like she really gravitated for a lot of advice. And I kept telling her, you need to talk to your husband. You need to uh, direct that to your husband. And finally, I told her, look, don't call me. Don't text me. And don't come and talk to me. I'm not going to be a surrogate husband to you. I'll be your pastor, but I'm not going to be a husband replacement. I want to point uh, the ladies to their husbands because biblically that's where the order lies. And, uh, and so then uh, when she stopped coming to church, she said, well, a pastor has a phobia of women, and that's not true. I was just trying to get her really to fall in line with uh, getting dialed into looking at her husband for spiritual direction. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. And uh, we just kind of we're going to go with that. Obedient to their own husbands. You know, and some ladies, they'll come to church and they'll kill themselves at church and just plug in here and then neglect home. And that's wrong. The Bible teaches us that. Listen, one of the most spiritual ministries you can have is that you plug yourself into home. And I'll tell you, ladies, at any point, when something you're doing here at church causes home to suffer, you choose home. There's no conflict there. You plug in where you need to be at home, and you'll be a complement and a completer at home. That's what the scripture says. I'll take an amen or two on that. Guys, I'm trying to help you out here. And ladies, I'm trying to help you as well uh, to keep dialed into where God has placed you. That the word of God be not blasphemed. So whenever these things are not in place, then the word of God is blasphemed. So we're going to talk in just a moment. Ladies, how you can make your home beautiful. We're going to review very quickly two points that we covered last Sunday night with God's help and a little bit of fast talking. We're going to get all the way through it because I have two more points to cover. Father, help us as we look at your word. Help us to be a help. Help us to be help tonight. And I pray uh, that we would take what we hear tonight from your word, that we would take it not as instruction from me, but rather specifically what you say in your word. And help us to plug it in. Help us to apply it so that we can be happy, healthy, and holy. In your name we ask it. Amen. First of all, ladies, in order to make your home beautiful, the Bible talks about the legacy that you're supposed to leave. And the legacy is that godly ladies are to set an example for the younger women. We talked about that. And you're to be holy in your lifestyle. The Bible says there's a holiness about the way you live that is something that's very beautiful. The word holiness has something to do with that word priest. And we mentioned that last Sunday night. When the priest was in the presence of the incense and in the presence of the Lord, when that priest came out into the congregation with the, with the folks, his clothing smelled like the incense that he was burning on the altar. And people could smell him. I smell that. And that is something that just permeates all of you. How many of you have had a, uh, some kind of campfire? You've been to a campfire this year yet? How many, how many have been? Okay, very good. And I like campfires, but there's one thing I don't like about a campfire, and that's how the smoke gets in your hair. You ever notice that? And it, it I mean, you really have to work to get out. You can wash your hair, it still smells like smoke. Uh, toothpaste works. Pastor, toothpaste in your hair? I've done it. Sometimes when that smell is just so strong. But that is what the Bible says that your holiness should be. It just ought to permeate. Like when you walk, I'm not saying you have a halo, but I'm saying there's something about your godly living that just really radiates from you. 
That's how the aged women are to be. The Bible says that the aged women uh, are also to be godly in their speech. We're talking about the legacy that you leave. Godly in your speech. Will you be remembered for having a sharp tongue or a godly tongue? The Bible says in that lineup of godly speech, not to be a false accuser or not to be a scandal monger. And boy, in the day that we live, not just ladies, but men as well, there have never been more avenues for us to jump into everybody else's business. And the book of Proverbs tells us that we're supposed to remove our foot from our neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee. And there's a lot of individuals that are wearing a lot of other individuals out because they always have their foot in somebody else's business. And the Bible here tells us that the legacy of a godly lady is to not be a false accuser, to be careful with your tongue. And that word false accuser is talking about the devil. The devil is known as the accuser of, fill it out with me, the brethren. That means we just don't lay our tongue on people. Some lady came to uh, the, the altar at the end of the service, a pastor is down there and received her. And she said, Pastor, I'd like to lay my tongue on the altar. That was really huge for her to do that. He says, I'm sorry, sister, our altar is only 40 feet long. A home that is filled with slander and gossip is an ugly home. And you will teach your children... To malign other people, you would teach your children to be a gossip. You will teach your uh, child to constantly be a busybody by the way that you live that out. The Bible tells us also that uh, she's to be free from addictive things, and we talked about that. And what the Bible uses there is not given to much wine. These are three words that are put together that is talking about a intoxicating wine. The combination of those three words is not only somebody who does not drink it, but somebody who stays completely away from it. 52 times in Scripture, there are references that are speaking against or detailing the bad behavior of somebody who drinks alcoholic fermented beverage. The Bible's very clear on this. Don't mistake that in the scripture, sometimes the word wine is not only referring to something that's alcoholic, but it's also referring to what I have in my refrigerator right now, grape juice. Did you know in the scripture that even grapes on the vine are called wine? So we just need to understand in the context, exactly what the Bible's talking about, and in this particular passage, is talking about ladies abstaining from alcoholic beverages. I cannot tell you the wreck and ruin that has been brought into homes and into people's lives, not just with ladies, but with men also, by alcohol. It's a devil. It's a devil. There's a reason why they call it spirits. Uh, I love the saying that the Japanese have, which is this. They say, first the man takes the drink, then the drink takes the man. But Titus 2 is talking more than just alcohol, but in the spirit of the passage, things that are addictive. And sometimes people are addicted to things. And we're not just talking about drink or smoke or pills. But sometimes people are addicted to other things. There are such a thing as uh, uh, adrenaline junkies. And I mean, they just have to have that rush. Uh, there are some men, good men, that are addicted to video games. I was talking with Brother Eddie a few years back, and we were talking at length. He's talking about some of the young adults that he's working with. Men who will stay up all night. Spend good money. <laughs> Talking about one a man and his, and his wife uh, who grew up in their youth group. And here this man, beautiful wife. <laughs> Rather than going to bed with his wife, stay up all night and in a matter of about a year, 
put themselves $30,000 into debt playing video games online. Now you can say what you want to say, but the point at which you lose sleep and don't go to bed with your wife, who you chose to marry, you have a problem. <laughs> you have a problem. That's just an addiction. And the Bible answer to that is temperance. It's not self-control. It's our will under Holy Spirit control. And we need to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit's control. Anything that controls you, that becomes addictive, needs to be yielded to God's Holy Spirit. And we need to say, Lord, I'm willing to totally forsake this if this is a hindrance. So these are the things that a godly woman lives as a legacy. She teaches the younger women how to be homemakers, and that's so needed. She's to teach also, the Bible says, how to be good. And that word good there is talking about family values. It's talking about parenting gaps. And we talked about that. Uh, some of us uh, have gaps the way that we were raised. There are some things that our parents did not teach us. Rather than be angry at your parents and blast it on social media, just take that to the, your prayer closet and say, Lord, I realize I have some gaps in how I was raised. And so, Lord, I want you to help me. And Lord helping me, I'm going to break that cycle. And in our home, we'll do something different. And that's where the older ladies, they move in and say, hey, here's some things that I'd like to help you with. In our country today, we need godly grandmothers. We need godly older ladies here at church that will teach the younger ladies how to be home makers. And young ladies, open your eyes. You walk into somebody's home and you notice that they do something well. Say, hey, show me how you do this. I want to learn this. I need to learn from Ray how to garden. I stink at it, but man. And uh, Dennis Reisner, he's like, the, he's like the plant whisperer, okay? He's like the plant guru, and he starts talking to me about plants, and he's like on a different planet from me. But man, I like it when those baskets of vegetables come around. He knows what he's doing. This is the legacy that you are to leave. Uh, Brother Steve told me at the beginning of the service, he said that one of the things that uh, Pastor Smith spoke about was leaving a legacy. That's a big deal. It's a big deal deal. Number two, not only the legacy that she's to leave, but we spoke about the love that she is to learn. Notice verse number four, where the scripture says this, would you read aloud with me, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, there are a lot of folks that know very little about love. I grew up in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, corduroy pants. It's a sin to put corduroy pants on fat children. I'm telling you, when I was walking, woof, 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 and I had short legs to try to keep up with my older brothers. And I promise it's a miracle that my pants didn't catch on fire, friction fire. And uh, that's kind of funny, isn't it? Uh, you'll get it if you, if you grow up with corduroys. But I know this, that what the world was teaching and singing about love in the 70s has nothing to do with what the scripture says about love. And so in the scriptures, the Bible tells us that the godly older women are to teach the younger women how to love. How do you love a child? How do you love your spouse? Well, we can start with what love is not. And of course, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, we have a complete list of what love is and what love is not. Love is not controlling. That's not love. That's manipulative. 
When you love somebody, you don't have to control them. You don't have to think for them. You allow them to be uniquely and beautiful, the person that God made them to be. And that's important. As husbands, we are to be loving to our wife. Ladies are to be loving to their husband. And the Bible says that they need to be taught how to do that. And that teaches us two things. Number one, that you can learn how to love your husband and your children. Number two, it teaches us that you need to learn that. And it's not just the ladies, it's the men as well. How are we to love? The Bible says the men are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Well, how did he love the church? Sacrificially, he gave his all. How much? And I love when people do this, you know. They say, Jesus said, this is how much I love you. And he opened his arms and he died for us. And that's how Christ loved the church. The Bible says that he loved the church and he gave himself for it. But many today don't know what love is. They don't know how to love their children. How do you love a child? And some folks have a very broken thinking about love. Some people think love is like a piggy bank. You have a piggy bank, I have a piggy, piggy bank. You put a love coin in my piggy bank, then that means I put a love coin in your piggy bank. When you do something that I consider is not that loving, I take a coin out of your piggy bank and uh, vice versa. And so they're operating on this value system. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And that sounds kind of reasonable in your mind when you play it out, but it's a terrible way to raise children in a terrible way to operate a marriage. The Bible says we each love each other as much as we can and God fills in the gaps and there's buffer. So how do you love a child? You tell them over and over again, I love you. That does not mean I own you. That does not mean I tell you what to do. And we understand we're not talking about obedience. You tell them that you love them, verbalize it. Number two, you touch them. Touch in a proper way your children. It's okay for you to hug your child. And uh, uh, yesterday, I got a big hug. I got a big hug today uh, from the grandkids. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's awesome. But you hug your, you hug your children. And you teach them. You teach your children day by day, line upon line, precept upon precept. You know, a lot of parents are just very permissive the whole time their child's uh, growing up. And then in their senior year, they're like, oh! And then it's like, you need to know this, you need to know this, you need to know this. It's like, whoa, whoa, slow down. <laughs> now we're trying to like cram for an exam. But it doesn't work that way. Line upon line, day by day. And the greatest teaching is by example. By example. Ooh, doo, doo. We said this right at the end of the message last Sunday night. Radical feminists have taught women that having a career is more important than having a home. And I disagree with that. I'm not saying that some ladies don't work so that they can help to provide. And that's not a negative. Read uh, Proverbs 31 and you understand uh, that a godly woman can be a woman of industry and business. However, material goods are not more important than children. Period. The feminist movement has progressed in such a way that in the 70s, how many of y'all remember Billie Jean King? Okay, we're dating ourselves, okay? In the 70s, the motto of the feminists was, I am as good as a man. Then in the 90s, I am equal to a man. 2021, I am a man. You see the progression of feminism? And I'm here to tell you, big and bold, 
that feminism goes against the Word of God. Now, I'll take an amen for that. Ladies, God designed you in such a beautiful and a unique way. You're not in competition with anybody. You just be uniquely and beautiful and beautifully who God made you to be. A woman is 100% better than a man at being a woman. And a man is 100% beautifully better than a woman at being a man. You just be the person that God created you to be. You be what God made you to be, and that'll be the most incredibly beautiful thing you can be. And I'm here to tell you, if you're a Bible believer, it does not mean that you are to be a chauvinist, and it does not mean uh, that you somehow uh, are... are uh, to be uh, to subjugate women that is not the Bible teaching you got it wrong and somehow we uh, if we're not careful there's this mentality uh, men that you are better than and let's be honest okay the Bible calls the ladies the way he created them the weaker vessel physically they just are so what kind of man are you that you have to show the weaker vessel that you're better. I mean, we're talking about a Minnie Mouse mentality. And you need to graduate out of that. We have a generation today who look at children as being burdens rather than blessings. And we're getting to the point in America that we spend billions more on pets rather than raising children in the image of a holy God. I am not a dog grandpa. Now, my children have dogs, but I'm not a doggy grandpa. No, thank you. If you can show me that here, I'm in. But it's not here. And I'm not saying that I hate dogs, but I'm saying... God's design was never replacement. And let's just understand that. And I know that's just culturally totally different than where we're living now. There's something wrong while we're on it. There's something wrong when somebody can kill an animal and get 10 or 20 years of federal penitentiary, but they can take a human life and get a slap on the wrist. Amen. God help us. God help us. And it begins with our mentality. Let's just get a biblical mindset about this. I'm not saying that you ought to be abusive to animals. That's wrong. The Bible says that the righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. But there's something wrong when we put to death a child in his mother's womb when the safest place for a child ought to be in the mother's womb. In the Bible, so many women that God bestowed favor on, prayed for children, and God answered their prayers. Sarah was barren until she was 90 years old, Hebrews 11.11. 11. Jesus came from the line of Isaac. God answered Rachel and gave her Joseph as a child, and Joseph it was that delivered the nation of Israel, Genesis 30, 22 and 24. Ruth, who was barren, wanted a child, and she became the mother of Obed. Obed became the grandfather of David, Israel's greatest king. Elizabeth was stricken in years. Her and her husband John could not have children. They had prayed for children, and the time for them having children had come and gone, but God blessed them. Luke 7, 28, you can read how God blessed them with John the Baptist. Incredible, powerful prophet. Jesus said that none greater was born to a woman on this earth than John the Baptist. Hannah was in the temple praying and sobbing, and she was praying for a child. And God gave Hannah this little man, Samuel. And the only negative that I can find in Scripture about Samuel, the only thing of his whole life, and he lived a long, long life, is that he had some failures in how he raised his children. But he was a God-fearing, upright man. 
Being a homemaker is not easy, it's not glamorous, but I'm here to tell you tonight on the authority of the Word of God that there is no higher calling. And if you work, ladies, I hope that you find some success at what you do. And I hope you enjoy what you do, and I hope that they pay you well for what you do, but I want you to understand that your greatest accomplishment in life will never be a plaque or a trophy, it will be your children. Let's just know that. The older women are to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. Then there's the lifestyle that she's supposed to live. Remember that there's a legacy she's going to leave. There's going to be the love that she's supposed to learn. And these are the things that will make your home beautiful. A loving home. No man, no child wants to come to a home that's like a battleground where you're walking on eggshells and you're being you're under attack all the time. It's like, boom, here come the mortars. No, that's not home. Home ought to be a loving place. Number four. How sad is it when you drive by the TNT bar, married men sitting at the bar when they ought to be home? Now, I don't know what all the reason is behind that, but I do know this. A loving place at home is a refreshing place to be. Amen? I'm not even going there for karaoke night, okay? I always thought it would be comical, but I'm not going. The lifestyle that she is to live. They used to have wee bowling, and that was really tempting. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to go bowl with a bunch of drunks on a wee, on a wee game system? I'm just being facetious. I'm hoping Drew's going to chop this out of the video. <laughs> we drove by. It says, we bowling Tuesday nights. I'm like, that's it. That's the thing that's going to pull me in there. Lifestyle that she is to live. Verse 5. Would you read aloud with me? Titus 2.5. To be discreet. Chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now we're just going to go through these words real quick so we understand what the Bible is trying to teach us. The word is discreet. The word, book of Proverbs uses the word quite a bit, discretion, discretion. What is discretion? I tell you one thing discretion is in 2021 in America, lacking. Lacking. She's to be discreet. The word is sensible. Using good judgment. We used to use the word common sense, but if you find it nowadays, you would call it uncommonly good sense. She uses good judgment in her shopping. She uses good judgment in her nutrition. She uses good judgment in bookkeeping, if she helps with that at home. And the different things that she's involved in. In. Brother Ray, would you look up a verse out of Proverbs 18.22? And then I wondered, let's see, if um, uh, Mrs. Chelsea, would you read Proverbs 31.12? And we're just going to pick up these two verses real quick that talk to us a little bit about what discretion looks like in the home. Go ahead. And we're talking about how somebody who's discreet, that uses good judgment, is a blessing from God. Go ahead, uh, Mrs. Chelsea. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She will do him good. Why? Because she's sensible. You know, here's the guy that's not worried about, uh, you know, when the end of the month comes because she's wasted or squandered all the money. She uses good judgment. That's what the scripture's talking about there. Then the Bible says not only is she to be discreet, but she's to be chaste. In verse number 5, I keep looking at 5 in chapter 3. It says, not works of righteousness which we have done. To be discreet, to be chaste. That word chaste means to be pure. Means to be clean. The older women need to teach the younger women the importance of keeping themselves pure for whom they marry and to keep themselves pure after they marry. And you just have to be careful. There are a lot of snakes out there. 
There are a lot of seducers. And so, ladies, you have to be careful for that. Maybe if you work and you feel like somebody is getting too close or is in your space, you ought to be very wise. It's very easy sometimes to be having a down day and to start leaning on a male coworker emotionally. And just be wise about that. Not only should you be pure and chaste, but it's something that you teach. Mothers should never leave it to the school system or to the children's buddies to teach their children about sexual morality. Sex education in secular schools will never work for good. It will only harm because it does not come from a viewpoint of godly morals and Bible truth. And that's just the fact of it. Intimacy between a man and a woman is not a dirty thing. It's a very beautiful gift that God has given to be within the boundaries of marriage. And that's how we ought to teach it. And we ought to be careful when we teach it, you know. And somebody says, well, you know, uh, I'm so glad that, you know, she kept herself pure till marriage. No, whoa! Time out. She's still pure after marriage. When she's in the confines of what God has taught. The Bible teaches us plain and simple that the bed is pure, that a marriage bed is undefiled. It's so important that we get the biblical mindset on morality. We don't have to dive into the trash to get something out. We ought to understand the importance of being morally pure. She's to be a keeper at home. So says verse number 5. Not only to be chaste, but a keeper at home. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that she can't leave the house. Okay? And if guys are like, oh, I'm going to keep her barefoot and pregnant. Okay. No. That's not what the Bible is teaching here. The Greek word for keepers at home means literally somebody who is industrious at home. And that means that that's an important responsibility. And it's a full-time job. And listen, if your wife works outside the home and comes home, uh, listen, if she's helping supplement the income and provide uh, for things at home, you ought to help out. Okay, you ought to help out. There's things that you can do to help. I'll take another amen on that. Okay, my wife isn't my slave. God didn't give her to me as some kind of live-in chef, laundry person. Okay, there's things that you can do to help. It's not going to kill you to clear the dishes off the table. It's not going to hurt you to put something in the fridge or take something out of the fridge. God forbid! If she's not home at noon to make you a sandwich. You know, you're pretty intelligent, fella. I think you can probably put a couple pieces of meat on a sandwich and put on there. You know what you like, put it on there. Well, she knows what I like. And you do too, dummy. Then make yourself a sandwich. She's not your slave. If she wants to go out with the ladies or wants to go out with the daughters or whatever... She doesn't have to be home at five to cook for you. You can figure it out. Okay, that's why God invented grape nuts and raisin bran. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm being a little facetious here, but I want you to understand that we sometimes have a wrong concept. We may not speak that out loud, but we live that in the way we act. And there may be a time that she may not be able to do that for you and that you're going to have to do that for her. And that's okay. And we mentioned this already. That simply working in order to have a bigger house or a nicer car. Or bigger vacations. Instead of spending time at home or with your children is a mistake. And we covered that. Ladies ought to be the queen of their home. And I mean that. And men, you ought to make your lady feel like a queen. There is no higher calling than to be a lady 
and to partake in what God has laid out for you and the completion and complement of your home. And that's not limiting to you. Proverbs 31 shares that a godly woman's activities uh, are travel, commerce, agriculture, investment in property, and involved in charity, all these things, but never done at the neglect of your household. And uh, those are just some things we're going to bump over because I said most of those things already. In the day that we live, some people scoff at the idea that a lady who's a Christian lady has an ambition to be a good wife and a good mother. Don't hang your head. You know, if you have uh, children, have a picture of your children and your husband on your desk, that's not a second rate thing. Because the highest and most meaningful thing we can do is to build godly Christian homes. That's all of us. Breakdown in our culture is a breakdown at home. The Bible says she's to be good. And the word good here does not simply mean not doing bad. It means to be kind-hearted. Kind-hearted. The Bible uses the phrase given to hospitality. Every home needs somebody with a good heart, not somebody who is hateful and sharp. The Bible says also that she is to be obedient to her husband. Now, we don't need to stutter at those words. That's what the scripture says. It's politically incorrect, but biblically true. It does not mean, men, that you're to be a, a dictator. We said that. The husband is to give loving leadership at home. But whenever there's a decision to be made and there's just not certainty on what the decision is, then in a godly and a loving way, it's the husband who's supposed to direct the home. When that thing is backwards, things get weird. And I've seen it more than once where an insecure lady taking control of the home has literally become a home wrecker. We're not talking about the chain of command. But we are talking about a godly acceptance of responsibility. Submission at home is not subjugation. It's not some man trying to put shackles on you. That's not what the scripture is saying. And men, if that's what you, was well, she supposed to obey me? Well, just a minute. Whoa. Time out. Maybe we need to have a understanding here. I don't know how many times in the last 16 years I've had a husband tell me that his number one need from his wife is for him to be respected. And when it boils down to it, it's generally talking about a man who has a pride problem. The husband is not superior to the wife. I want you to look at it in Ephesians 5.22, and we'll finish up with this. And we will finish this up, ladies. We're just trying to have a godly outlook on this. Ephesians 5, verse number 22, where the scripture states, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, so in the same way or because the church is subject or submitted under Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands, read the next three words, in everything. Now, go to verse number 21, men. I want only the men to read this nice and loud. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. The point at which, men, you are loving your wife on the same level that Christ is loving the church sacrificially, then at that point, when you're doing that, then you can jump on her for not submitting to you. Okay? All right. Let's keep going. 
The husband is to be to his wife what Jesus is to the church. This is not a punishment to the lady, but it is a protection for her. Just as God the Son is under God the Father and the Holy Trinity, the woman is to be under the man in God's scheme of things. It does not mean inferiority. We covered that. Jesus Christ is co-equal with God, but he submitted to him. Remember what the Bible says in the book of Philippians, chapter number 2? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, Jesus is God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And then we see the kenosis of Jesus, how Jesus humbled himself. No woman is inferior to a man. We all are one in Christ, but God is delineating the line of responsibility. A woman who rebels against this line of responsibility is going to have these difficulties. Number one, a difficulty with God, because he said it. A rebellious spirit is ultimately aimed toward God. This lady also is going to have difficulty with her husband. That creates a lot of friction when we have two people playing tug of war for control of the home. Number three, it creates difficulty with the children. When you are in a home where, the, where mom and dad are playing tug of war trying to gain control of the home, you have children ultimately that rebel against God. Check the track record. A wife who is not under the headship of her husband will not be able to have the spiritual authority with her children. I'm going to drop a little, I'm going to just lob a little grenade over the wall here. There is a problem with ladies who think that they don't have to be sub subject to their husbands because they think they're more spiritual than their husband. That's a problem. Because the Bible doesn't give a little spirituality clause in there. Some restrictions apply not available in all states, taxes, title. Okay, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that you're to be subject, oh, provided that he's more spiritual than you. Then you just follow everything he says. And if he's not, then you fill it in. The Bible never says that. And one of the great difficulties I've seen in church as pastor in the last 16 years are ladies who don't think that they have to be subject to their husband because they think that they're more spiritual than their husband. That's a bunch of hogwash. And it doesn't hold weight scripturally. Somebody who cannot be learned to be under authority cannot be trusted with authority. Somebody who cannot learn to be under authority cannot be trusted with authority. And that's for us too, men. Okay? He said, well, she's to be under me. That's right. You're to be under him. Now, let me ask you a question, fellas. Who comes under greater accountability? You do. These ladies that will not only have difficulty with God, difficulty with their husband, and difficulty with their children, but these ladies also have difficulty with themselves. Why? Because she'll never have her deepest needs met. The Bible says in Proverbs 31 that her husband's heart confides or rests safely in her. He trusts her. And ladies, when you don't have the confidence of your husband, uh, that's a tough one. Lifetime of labor is still worth.